So, thank you very much for attending. We will raise the question why it's important for emerging space countries to be involved in moon exploration. All space activities now for emerging countries is limited to space applications, Earth observation, communication satellites, but nothing about moon exploration. We will see that I'm not going to use the term moon exploration. I'm going to use the expansion of human civilization into outer space because this term involves all aspects of humanity, art, religion, and if we involve this, we will have a lot of opportunities. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the, the history, introduction about the history. We have to understand the history so we build for the future. And then, I, this, this presentation is more dedicated for decision makers and the general public in emerging countries. We need to convince them what's going now in the space community that is different than 20 years ago. Why there is a moon rush. Um, and then, um, I will say my two arguments, the Bogota Declaration and, uh, um, you know, the, the Explorer Gene. Why we have to do that. So in the beginning, there was a competition between uh, the two major powers, uh, the Soviet Union and the USA. It was a competition. And an important aspect at that era, let's say from the end, uh, the end of the uh, 50s until the mid-70s, the funding was um, mostly, or all the funding of space activities was for the government. And an important action happened uh, in 1967, which is the signature of the Outer Space Treaty at that time. We will come back to the Outer Space Treaty later. Later on, we started to see cooperation between the Soviet Union and uh, the United States. As you can see here, uh, to, to my left, you can see uh, a Soviet cosmonaut and American astronaut shaking hand in 1975 when the Soyuz and the Apollo was docking in space. So this is, this is a symbol of a new era of cooperation now. An important aspect of that era, you know, in, in 72 the Apollo program was ended and also we had the Luna program by the Soviet Union which is an unmanned mission to bring soil from the lunar surface. At that time, space community was so enthusiastic about the future. We can see that also in uh, uh, science fiction writings and movies and so on. So, by the end of the 80s, 90s, we started to see developing countries going to uh, doing space activities, but very limited to space applications and communications. Um, um, uh, an important, after that, uh, in, in uh, 2006-2007, Israel ex uh, discovered water in the lunar poles. Uh, and after that, a mission was confirming by, by NASA that there is water. So now, this is a game changer. Previously, we didn't know there was water in the moon. So the moon was a dead planet. Now we know that there is water. This means we don't, it's not only about life support system for astronauts, but it's also about manufacturing uh, uh, rocket fuels. So we can use the moon as a station um, uh, for uh, missions for Mars and, and beyond after that. This is a new development happened. This is a new thing. This is the discovery of water. To the left here, you can see uh, traces for uh, water, water uh, ice, actually, in the South Pole and also in the North Pole. Now, this, fig this figure shows NASA's budget since 58, since the establishment of NASA, as a percentage of the federal budget of the USA. As you can see here, there is a huge peak. By reaching 4.5% 4 of the federal budget in 67 until 70s. The reason why, the reason why of this peak is the Apollo program. There was a huge funding going on. However, if you look at 
2015, 2017, the, the NASA, NASA budget is only 0.5, less than that, 0.5% of the national uh, federal budget of the USA. By that time, there was the announcement of the Artemis program, and that announcement uh, was considering a sustainable mission, manned mission to the moon. So because of the advancement of technology, NASA now is capable to send a sustainable mission to build something in the lunar surface with the regular budget that was there since, uh, since 20 years. Unlike the Apollo program, the investment, well, the investment here, of course, was very beneficial. So the advancement of technology is another new thing. We have the discovery of water and the advancement of technology. Now, space policy, space lawyers, and officials came into the scene. The first time ever, in 2017, we started to see high officials in uh, uh, developed countries like the USA, for example, asking, calling for a strategy for moon exploration, sustainable moon exploration. I am hi highlighting here the call. This is the announcement by NASA. Sustainable. They wanted to, to we, we, we all know that. Sustainable, international partnerships, long-term exploration and utilization of resources. Again, we never seen a push from high officials from the governments. Uh, we saw in the 70s, for, for example, Gerard uh, O'Neill uh, 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 proposing how people can live in, in, in the lunar, in lunar orbit. We saw research, we saw scientists and engineers uh, coming up with ideas. But this is the first time we started to see officials speaking about that and drafting policies. This is a trend, actually. Not only NASA, but also if you check ESA, uh, the uh, Indian Space Agency, Chinese, the, the Russians, are all aiming and they announce plans for sustainable missions for the moon. This is a new trend now. So the, the presentation actually is to convince people in emerging countries that there is something huge happening right now. And you should not be late. You should, you should join that. Okay, my first argument. The Bogota Declaration to me is the first uh, conflict over space resources. Geostationary orbit is a natural is considered to be a natural resource because most of communication satellites are actually located in geostationary orbit. Um, in, in 1967, uh, sorry, 90, yeah, 1967, the Outer Space Treaty uh, mentioned that no country is eligible to have sovereignty over any part of space, the moon, any orbit. So it's just for those who can. Uh, reach there basically those with, with the technology and as you can see in the, in the, in the picture here the countries are located in, in, in the equator Indonesia, Zaire, those countries in 1976 um, questioned the applicability of the Outer Space Treaty and they signed the Bogota Declaration in 76, 11 years after the Outer Space Treaty. The Outer Space Treaty in 67 was drafted by three countries, the United Kingdom, the United States, and the Soviet Union. So the countries are left behind. And in 76, they are, they are questioning its, its uh, uh, applicability. Anyways, I, I am not a space lawyer. I'm not going to go through the details, but their, their questions, their requests were rejected by the, the, the United Nations. Basically, what they wanted to do they wanted to claim sovereignty over geostationary orbit. They wanted to, to make it like the, the Suez Canal, for example, but it was rejected. So it's it's a pity because they was not involved on drafting the space, the outer space treaty. That's that's the point here. It's difficult. This is a, an artist visualization of the Moon Village. Um, it's completely difficult to imagine such large-scale structures in the moon without utilizing resources from the lunar surface. We need to extract aluminum, iron, water, and sustain such a settlement. So 
Now we are talking about utilization of resources and therefore a huge cash of money. It's in our blood. Since we left Africa, we are always looking for new locations and new habitats to live in. Not only to live, but it's history. We are changing the entire ecosystem to make it suitable for us. This is like a hundred years, a hundred thousand years ago. So going to space is, a, is not a new thing to our species. We are expanding. We are expanding our, our species. So just, just imagine being in space and watching uh, the Earth rise. Earth is six times larger than the moon. So in the sky, you will see it really huge if you are in the, in the lunar surface. And it's actually more exciting because as you can see, you can see the clouds and you can see it moving. So maybe now you can see it this way. A little bit later, you will see the clouds moving in, in a different pattern. So it, unlike the moon, it's static. You can see it and it's larger, it's green, it's, it's blue. So it's really exciting. I, I mean, when, when I imagine it, I, I didn't go there, <laughs> but I, it's really exciting to, to think about it, to be, to, to be there. And this is called the overview effect. So in conclusion, there is an exceptional, we are living in an exceptional time where we are witnessing a moon rush. Our generation will be witnessing the starting of the cores, the nucleus of sustainable presence of humanity. People will be living there and some later on they will, they will call the moon their, their, uh, their home. So we are witnessing the starting of this right now. Um, we don't want to repeat the Bogota Declaration. That's why we need to have emerging countries on the table, drafting together with everyone, uh, with developed countries, uh, um, a policy for the utilization and the exploitation of space resources, starting from the moon. And of course, uh, lunar exploration is in our plot. So, thank you very much. Last but not least, the right question now, we should not ask why moon exploration for emerging country. This is the wrong question. We have to say, what will emerging space country lose from being left behind? Because space exploration, starting from the moon, is a destiny, not a choice. It's, it's a reality in the ground right now. Thank you very much. Okay.